Hi, my name is Raquel Urtasun. I'm Helen Tran. I'm Dave Sinton. My name is Rhonda McEwen. I'm Timothy Chan, and I'm the Associate Vice President and Vice Provost of Strategic Initiatives. What excites me about the strategic initiatives are the people behind these large research networks that are bringing together diverse communities to solve the world's grand challenges. As a researcher of emerging technologies, I will change the future by creating spaces for women in science, technology, engineering, and math to be able to solve the world's most important problems. As a molecular architect, I will change the world by figuring out new ways to bring molecules together and also take them apart. Instead of just making materials that are useful, can we design them so that they can be helpful for our environment and helpful for our human health and they can be reused? The future of advanced materials is designing them with sustainability in mind. As a mechanical engineer, I'll lead the future of energy by developing ways to store renewable energy and to use it to decarbonize our economy. I will change the world by making cell driving vehicles a reality, I promise you. As a healthcare engineer, I'm going to change the world by making healthcare smarter. We will lead the future of data-driven healthcare by developing smarter ways to optimize therapies and more efficient ways to deliver care. Through research and innovation, we are creating a bold future. It takes all of us to ignite new possibilities and solve grand challenges. We are the groundbreakers, change makers, and innovators. And the future looks really, really bright. Welcome to season two of Groundbreakers. The beauty of climate positive energy is that we harness the, the full intellectual power of the Tri Campus at University of Toronto. The starting point has to be the community, and it's the right starting point because it's ultimately the ending point. So tell me how your lab is responding to the net zero emissions 2050 goal. One of the most exciting things that's happened over the last 10 years is the growth of renewable low carbon electricity. So we're asking the next question, how do we, how do we store that? And how do we electrify processes that used to be powered by fossil fuels? So your background is in mechanical engineering. So how did you get into renewable energy? Oh, I'm a mechanical engineer on the fluid side, so pipes and valves, um, and, and traditionally the applications there were in power generation. Uh, but now there's a new, a new challenge ahead, and that's CO2, so the implications of that power generation. How do, we, how do we convert that into useful products? How do we store it? How do we capture it? Uh, that's really the, the next challenge, and that's the renewable energy challenge at the heart of my research. So tell me about some of the exciting things that are happening in your lab and the things that you're looking at to address climate change. Great, yeah. We started you know, years ago in fuel cells, electrochemical systems, um, and now we're looking at systems that look similar, use a lot of that knowledge, but do so to convert CO2 into products using renewable electricity. There, the technical challenge for the mechanical engineers is, is getting CO2 to that reactive site, getting products away, ensuring the local conditions are productive for that reaction, and ensuring the whole system works efficiently. That's the mechanical engineering challenge. Climate change is an enormous challenge, so why is the time right now to tackle it? Oh, the key is that our values have changed. You know, the, you look at the the public, government, organizations, companies worldwide have pledged net zero 2050. Uh, we've had a, a major shift and we're committed. Awareness is raised. Uh, that job is done. The next job is how do we do this transition? And, and we can see that transition here at U of T. Uh, that glorious engines lab, that's taught a century of engineers. And the question is, what's the next act? What's the next challenge? The next challenge is net zero 2050. It's energy transition. Now you have a little over 25 students working um, in your, your lab. Um, can you talk about how important they are to some of the research work that's coming out of the lab here? Oh, sure. Uh, I mean, they do it. They do the work. And, and not just executing on the research vision, but, but I find really the best ideas come out of the lab. They, they come from students who are, who are working uh, at the coalface in a, in a renewable energy context. Why are you so passionate about working in renewable energy? 
So I remember in high school, I thought um, engineers are really problem solvers, and I was really passionate about fighting climate change and building a better future for all of us. So I went into engineering um, with the mindset that with the knowledge that I learn and the brilliant people that I'm working with, we'll be able to come up with solutions um, that will hopefully benefit everyone. Let's talk about some of those solutions and um, tell me a little bit about the XPRIZE competition and sort of what you were trying to do uh, when it comes to carbon capture. This project kind of, you know, started in the lab. Um, we have great expertise in electrochemical systems and engineering. Um, so we were doing a lot of CO2 utilization, but we branched out into CO2 capture. So one of our advisors, Alex, he came to us and he said, hey, Elon Musk, um, he's doing this big XPRIZE competition and we think you'd be a great fit. In terms of direct air capture, there's a lot of different methods. So the one that we're focused on is is using an alkaline capture solution. So it captures carbon dioxide directly from the air and it becomes um, an ion inside the solution. So our specific innovation is taking this carbon dioxide that's inside the solution and finding a way to release that CO2 um, in a very energy efficient way. I always um, believe that the solution to climate change came from um, a group of people all working together. So that's policymakers, um, that's educators and scientists. Kate, you're doing amazing research work in a remote area in Canada. Can you talk about your environment and where you are? Yeah, so where am I in the world? Well, right here, I'm on the traditional territory and unceded territory of the Taku River Klingit and it's right at the BC-Yukon border. Their traditional territory spans both sides. We're in a quite remote area in the subarctic, so long summer days, as you can see from the sunshine, short winter, quite cold in the winter, and an abundance of uh, solar power this time of year. Can you explain what Canada's energy storage challenge is? Yeah, so can that's a great question. Canada has a number of storage challenges for energy. But the main one I would say is seasonality. So we have a lot of possible energy in the summer months from hydropower, from solar power, from wind. And as you can see here at the cabin, it's a great example. The sun is pouring in, but in the winter, we have very few hours of sunlight. And so this poses a big challenge. How do we harness the incredible energy possibilities we have in the summer to see us through the winter in a way that isn't environmentally damaging? We know it's solving some of these really big challenges. Having the community voice is so important. Can you talk a little bit about how you're working with the community to co-design some solutions to solving the energy storage challenge? Yeah, it's a really important part of our work, thinking about working with communities rather than starting with technological solutions and offering them once they're already complete and finalized. So one of the ways that we're starting up here in the North is we're working with existing relationships and existing partnerships, uh, particularly between one of our partners, Yukon University, and some of the indigenous communities that really are the leaders in renewable energy. So how does equality and justice factor into solving the energy storage challenge? Yeah, so Inka, that's a great question. When we think about equality and we think about justice, those are right at the core of what we're doing at the Climate Positive Energy Initiative, and really in all the work that we're, we're aiming for. So one of the things to remember is that the production of energy, the use of energy always has a cost, whether it's fossil fuels from the ground and the destruction of landscapes and emissions that go with it, whether it's these kind of solar panels that we're looking at that take up space that require metals and minerals. We really know that there isn't a way of producing energy that someone doesn't bear some consequence. So what would it look like to have the communities that are implicated in, those, in bearing those burdens uh, share in the decision making around the technologies? What would it look like to incorporate multiple goals and values into the decision making over energy futures? What is energy being used for? Where is it being produced? Who's doing it and who's benefiting from that? These are questions that we want to ask uh, in the context of the Canadian picture and also more globally. And in fact, I think we need to think beyond climate goals. We need to think more broadly about a series of uh, initiatives that will help us achieve healthy, happy communities 
healthy, happy, thriving uh, communities across ecosystems, across landscapes, across the north and south. So we need to think about supply chains, we need to think about food systems, we need to think about energy, crossing all of those different areas.